You're listening to The Adventuring Party, talking about gaming the Irish way. Welcome to the party. I'm Dave. I'm Owen. I'm still savage. And I'm Warlord Scar. And today we have a question. Say hello, question. Hello. I am, in fact, the question. And, and tell us, uh, oh, question, what form do you take today? Today, I take a question that goes to the very heart of man. Man's, and woman's indeed, fear. And in this case, I am talking about fear of something that is different than what you were used to. You're, imagine, if you will, you're playing a, a game. Could be a fantasy-based game, could be a sci-fi game. But it's been going well. Everybody knows the part. Everyone's kind of gotten used to the, the campaign, the setting. But then somebody makes a decision. Not necessarily intentionally, but could be just by an accident. Someone decides to uh, check out, you know, decides to go, well, what happens if I try and grapple this person? And then a look of horror emerges over everyone's face. Because in doing so, somebody has opened up the door. A door to another world. To bring another gaming system that is going to intrude into your carefully crafted campaign. Your entire game session is about to be derailed as a new and different game subsystem comes into play. You're about to receive a visitor that came from a place of poor playtesting. I'm talking, of course, about poorly designed game subsystems that just you know derail everything you plan to do that day. Aha, uh-huh. okay. So, the question, for it is you, uh, has brought us a really interesting uh, topic. The uh, question, obviously, uh, we've kind of met on our Discord. Join our Discord. Link the show notes. Thought I'd get that one in early. Um, and we have... What, the question is one of our heroes. Uh, heroes in the Discord, anyways, really, who's been on as a guest or as a, uh, a guest host or any other sort of favorite hostage. Yeah, that's probably a good way to describe them. Um, mm-hmm. And you could be too if you wish to, you know, pose a question like the question, uh, and we might cover it on the show. But uh, okay, let's turn our minds then to the matter at hand. It's a great question. Subsystems and uh, and. Like, you know, the ones you don't notice, fine. But the ones that do, everyone goes, oh no, this again. Any uh, any great examples out there? I think the uh, the one that people have uh, brought up time and again is the infamous hacking minigame, uh, specifically of the, the many uh, cyberpunk RPGs. Yeah, but I mean, that, 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 that's a chapter which, uh, like, even if somebody fears no man, they'll fear that chapter. Uh, it, the, have you ever actually looked into how the different systems handle it? Because it's funky different as hell. Versions of like different cyberpunk style games. Yeah, uh, pretty familiar with the Shadowrun one. I remember plotting out mm. nodes and ice in Second Ed way back. Not so much actual cyberpunk. I don't think I know much about that one. I guess uh, cyber- uh, twenty twenty. Yeah, like so- yeah, it's maps. It's it's yes. pretty much a dungeon crawl sort of ish. <laughs> And it's it's really weird because a lot of the early nerds were also early, you know, computer users. So they kind of understood some stuff about how computers worked. And they put together this system that they thought sort of mapped it. So it's really funky. Uh, and then if you look at something like uh, Cyberpunk, right? The Netrunner CCG comes out in, during the CCG boom of the mid-90s. Great game. And one of the things that gets adapted is they actually put together a uh, Rache Bartimos' Brainware Blowout, which was oh, the yes. hardware and software compendium for Cyberpunk. And one of the things it did was it had Cyberpunk rules and card conversions for the Netrunner CCG. Oh, very good. And a bunch of, diff- a bunch of ways to turn cards from the Netrunner CCG into equipment in your game but also ways to run uh, hacking using the Netrunner game. 
as opposed to their own subsystems. And a simple way to automate it so that basically you could literally throw cards at the Netrunner player and go, here, handle and hack yourself. And they kind of oh, built okay. and kind of played this little automated PC mini game. Hmm. Again, could like have fun it, with that. It kind of, but the player is off at this corner on his own. Uh, sure, but, you, but, you, but you're also going like, <laughs> okay, the goons are about to come around the corner, and the street samurai's like, Johnny, get the door open. And Johnny's like, I gotta shuffle again, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Lost count. Absolutely. Um, I just need to access the right program. It's possibly a good... It's possibly... Okay, so this covers like the entire gamut of this episode. It's a recognized and well-established subsystem. It's a big subsystem. It represents something that in the game world is meant to take milliseconds. <laughs> and it has... And the irony, of course, like most of these subsystems we're going to discuss, is that it, it is... It's entirely its own thing. It takes forever. <laughs> and, and it kind of pulls one of the players and the GM away to do something. Or in this case, they've, they had to release a CCG, release a splat book, and then build a subsystem to automate what the, what the GM would otherwise have to stand over while the player was busy kind of pulling cars it, it, and equipment out. It's sort of amazing a, a, a thing where you... Do you do this kind of thing like with an open lock check or the like? Do you just let the player roll dice at a problem or and just say, okay, that, that was simple, move on? Or do you want to, to like quote unquote feel like hacking? And I think that is a lot of the things is like. Some, uh, go ahead. Some men would argue do we really have to have a subsystem for combat? Can't I just make a fight check and move on? Some games do. Uh, yeah. I, I believe some games do have that. Some games all will the, do that, yeah, but like all the way into the weeds. There, you see. I think if the ge- if it's meant to be an important part of the game, it should the game that part of the game should probably have a bit of mechanical heft to it. And if it needs a bit of mechanical heft, it might end up using a slightly different subsystem to the main core resolution mechanic. And I think this is where you get in the weeds. You want it to feel different and important. So you end up designing a different subsystem. And as you go deeper in there, you're like, well, I, it should feel more like actual hacking. You have to get access and get through firewalls and there's programs out there to stop you. And you start adding more stuff on because you're kind of into it. And you end up designing this whole boondoggle that's everyone else is going to bounce. Like one player interacts with regularly, the GM interacts with in sufferance and everyone else is mystified. Oh, it's just, I, I think it may be, it, it's a problem of playtesting in the sense that the hacking rules were almost certainly probably playtested very well and extensively, but maybe they, nobody had the idea of, well, how do we playtest this in a party game and what the other party member is doing? Because I imagine that, you know, it would have become very obvious very quickly, three to four people are just doing nothing here while you're doing this. You'd think, wouldn't you? There was a... An experience we used to have in uh, Elf of War playtest, the CCG. And one of the things that happened was I would go, has anyone read the spells cards? And everyone was like, oh, God, no. And I said, you've got to read the spells cards, lads. There's some broken stuff in there. But because everyone would just go, oh, I don't use spells. Just, just, I'm not going to bother looking at them. I can't evaluate when they're good or not, really. So you need a certain amount of expertise and to touch on it. And people only the interested people play test it, so only the interested people give feedback, so it all looks fine. And then the non interested people interact with it and go, "What is this madness?" Go on, uh, uh, Scar, you were saying. Well, I was just going to say, like, the issue with a lot of these things is like they want it to be more than just oh, it's an open locks check, but with computers. Um, but because it's a single player part of the game essentially they don't see an obvious in universe way to have multiple people in the party you know contribute to hacking they they but they still want it to be an in-depth system so they they they're, they're, there's no they, the desire looking for this cyberpunk experience doesn't see a way to compromise they have to they have to make it feel, quote unquote, feel like hacking, but also um, it has to work like hacking. And that means you have to exclude everyone from the party 
and and but also make it really complicated and like it's obvious that a compromise has to happen but where is the compromise and like if you're looking for that particular feel it'd be hard i've often thought like if you approach the problem from a game a game is point of view you can very easily have it so that it's like sort of mini combat where each party member who's not the hacker could like take the role of someone's uh hacking software like you you know the fighter yeah. becomes the 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 brute force um hmm. the, the, the brute force program and the you know the uh, street mage becomes the support program or the you know Something like that, but that's not a thing that happens in the cyberpunk novels. Um, it doesn't happen in Neuromancer, so game designers don't put that kind of thing in. They're Give the cyberpunk people are approaching it from the will, will you be my Pokemon? <laughs> <laughs> will you get in my pocket so I can pull it's, you it's out of me? Digimon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is Digimon. I love Digimon, underrated show. Let's just let's just take a, a wild sidetrack for a second. Okay, um, th- I suppose the problem with that scar is, uh, you know, given that we are now playtesting the unplaytestable, uh, is that <laughs> the subsystem, uh, getting everyone involved, great, laudable, worthy goal. It's now going to take even longer <laughs> to get it sorted. <laughs> but it's but a I, I, do, I, I think you're absolutely right, though. It's You've got to, you know, it's it's a real shame because this falls to the GM. Like, how do I keep everyone else engaged while exploring this kind of really valid part of the fantasy? In this case, hacking. Um, oh, okay, you know what? Question. I'm going to throw it back to you here. Any answers for this? Is there any way to get around this, or is this really is intractable? I think to to use a kind of like you know to to adapt a kind of business parlance, it's fun fast you know in depth pick two like they and they went with maybe in depth and fun question mark but just not one that involved the whole party um i think you can either have a faster system that isn't necessarily in depth but you know if it's only one person doing it but it's really quick i don't think that's going to be an issue whereas if you are going to make it take long yeah, consider drawing the other p- players in uh, with the the proviso of okay, yeah, this is slow, but like, it's either something that's really quick and not really, um, in you know involved or something that that is involved, but for one person and that slow. And I think that that's the worst combination of things. So I think yeah, maybe Shane's idea of slowing it down, but if you want to slow it down, just bring everybody else in, or you speed through it and. Just to get through it because you're you're taking time away from other gamers. I I mean the, the, another poor compromise is just to go back to like maybe it deal it with deal deal with it as uh, two to three open objects rather than one and just have say what is how fast do you get in one is do you trip the alarms and uh, three is do you get additional information or, or something like that you know you can still make and and different software that you bring so that the whole build your decking rig aspect comes back in if you're still playing the equipment porn version of cyberpunk you know we're playing the equipment porn version of cyberpunk you're not playing cyberpunk right just saying let's go shopping (laughs) Uh, (laughs) okay um so we've like that's the, the clear sort of poster child for this problem is definitely hacking and the hacking sub-games in various cyberpunk. Yeah. Do we have any other good examples of subsystems that seemed like such a good idea at the time? I but, think uh, one, I'd so argue much. magic in general, like most systems. That's sort of a thing where it's it's less that the magic is like a dis- undesirable thing, but that is very clearly it, ha- it has been given so much extra attention over the mundane, uh, I roll dice and hit sword with man. Well, I'll, I'll 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 give a very simple example of what I'm getting at. Um, compare the size of the combat rules in in most editions of D and D to the size of the magic rules in any edition of D and D. we're very well aware of how big the the spell lists can get. See uh, see our spell call episodes. Ongoing. Yeah. we're not sure if these hosts will finish yeah. it, but they certainly started it. Um, yeah, are, are you referring to? 
uh, the size of just the spell resolution rules, or the are you folding in all of the spell lists as well? I am also. I am. Yeah, I'm also folding in the size of the spell list. But for one aspect of the game, it's it's voluminous. That's one way of putting it. Yeah, it's yeah, you know, absolutely. It would it would appear if examining it from space that this is a game about casting spells and sometimes people fight with swords. And of course, the the, the fine art of dungeon mastering is basically about uh, f- handing out magic items. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What matters and what what do we say matters? Um, okay, yeah, magic magic systems in general. Some more than others. Uh, one I wanted to highlight as a subsystem because it's wild because it's in a game about magicians is the magic system from Mage Second Edition World of Darkness, oh. where yeah, I, I heard that growing. Oh, oh Hida, would you like to uh, would you like to sort of expand on that? All right, so. One of the things about Mage's system is it's technically universal in that everybody has a set of kind of effectively spheres of influence that they can affect with their reality altering powers. It's just that everyone's paradigm is different. So uh, one guy's, you know, I'm going to use forces to lightning bolt somebody is I have to build a device to shoot people with lightning where another person chants the mystic words and lightning bolt hits them or another one asks an angel to do it for them. So they're all the same. Uh, so And then you get into an argument, a big argument, whether if I use an angel to throw a lightning bolt at somebody, is that forces? Or do I also have to add prime because I'm creating energy? The answer is usually yes. Do I then also have to use life because I'm creating an angel to throw a lightning bolt at somebody? And some people will tell you, yes, you have to also use life to create the angel to throw the lightning bolt. And they're like, but it's just flavor. And they're like, no, 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 no. No, you need to do the other thing as well. Some people say, coincidental magic, I'm going to teleport onto the scene, and the way I'm going to do it is by driving up in a taxi and getting out of it. And some people will be just like, yeah, just use correspondence to do that. Other people are like, no, you need correspondence. You also need matter matter and prime to create the taxi and forces to move the taxi. And they all need to be involved in the system. Because you get, there are two, there are different schools of thought about whether it is effects-based and it's just effects based the matter. And then there's another crew said, no, every effect that you flavor into your thing to make it look coincidental must also come from a sphere source and must be included in the complexity of the task. I'll just cast fireball then. <laughs> oh, par- paradox kills you. Oh, bad luck. <laughs> bad luck. Well, that was about as elegant and eloquent a way of illustrating the problem as I could have hoped for. Yeah, it's a the magic system is mechanically fine as far as the world of darkness goes but yes when actually figuring out at the table with your gm or even the you know other interested parties uh, how it works complete nightmare and it's a massive hmm. subsystem i mean it's you know, argue because there's still the combat like you can just hit the guy <laughs> with the katana yeah with the katana for preference because let me tell you guys the damage code is just way better if you so want to go, if you want to go look back at Oriental Superiority, the the you oh. do not touch L five four. Go and take a look at uh, <laughs> at uh, Watsi and uh, not Watsi uh, World, Dar- uh, World oh. of Darkness in the uh, mid nineties. You know why is Ophelia was pretty high? Why is the katana two more damage dice than the longsword? Because Japanese steel folded one thousand times. <laughs> yeah, because the the, the, the art of Japan is generally not very good. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's 1,000 times to get away from having crappy base materials. <laughs> okay, go. so that was, uh, that's two, that's magic systems. Um, Hida, do you have a, a favorite? Uh, not magic system, but subset that we haven't covered yet? Uh, one that's kind of weird, like, if you ever look at, I've mentioned Exalted's crafting system a couple of times. Because it's a complete boondoggle that you cannot do at the table. You have to tell the player, just go away, go away and do it, and then come back and tell me what happened. Um, because <laughs> it's stuff like. Larry. So let's say you're, I'm your crafter and exalted, and you say to me, I want a flying sky chariot that we can deploy our troops out of to conquer this thing. And you go, right, okay, I'm going to go and build that. And we'll look at the third edition system, and I'm like, okay, of the. 700 charms in this book 320 of them are crafting like every other ability is like 10 or 15 crafting is over half and like nearly half the charms okay so you go okay look 
I don't know how they designed it. Not how I would have done it, but that's where we are. And it's stuff like, okay, this is a dice adder. This is a dice adder that allows me to ro- re-roll eights. Uh, eights explode now. This is a separate charm that lets uh, nines explode. This allows sevens to explode. This allows me to re-roll sixes. This, uh, this is the kind of stuff that's in it. Uh, nice. Like thousands, like no, not thousands, but certainly uh, well over 100 charms of just dice manipulation. And what happens is you go, okay, oh, I want you to build that. Now, I'm like, all right, I need gold XP. And you're like, what the hell is gold XP? Oh, there's three types of crafting experience. What? When I make stuff, I earn bronze experience. And when I want to make something that rewards silver experience, I need bronze experience. And when I want to make something that requires gold experience, I need silver experience. So I'm going to make uh, you your crafting thing. So the guy comes away. Three hours later, you come back to me asking about this golden sky chariot. And I am winching, uh, basically, bread milled from the corn of heaven onto <laughs> a slice of cheese uh, brewed from the celestial yak's milk on top of a second slice of bread. And you go, I thought I, thought I asked you to make a flying ship. And I go, what does it look like I'm doing? <laughs> I'm making this to get the bronze XP so I can get to use that to make the silver XP to get the gold XP. What is wrong with you, you idiot? I think I've this sounds hellish. Like the oh, best part okay. about all that is once you do make your gold sky chariot and you start to use it, you just you have the biggest disappointed look in your face because you realize you spent about two, three weeks of your life doing this. And then, you know, one of the other players just said, I hear it's a bunch of money. I'll buy a sky chariot. Just go wherever we, and they have essentially the same uh, level of uh, same experience as you do. Uh, and and then, then one of the enemies just says, I have, I have a wind charm and I, and I walk around like a sky chariot. Good times. Um, okay, yeah. absolute cracker. Uh, yeah, wild crafting systems. That one sounds particularly in depth. Well, it is. It's, it is. It's it's the most in depth I think of any. This is a game about punching people with heaven, right? No, it's not. It's not about that at all. It's meant to be about that, but no, it's not about that at oh, all. Oh well, we covered that in our cuckoo episode, didn't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's sort of one of those things of uh, a kind of a separate, similar idea is the idea of. Um, like systems that really should be done between the sessions, but because the desire to do the thing, like the like the the, the idea, we should make a sky chariot, doesn't happen between session. It happens in the middle of the session, and so you start thinking, well, three hours before we have to go home, so we should clearly spend those uh, that time getting our sky chariot, right, right. But mm. the 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 crafting system. Is uh is is designed is, is is it it works best when it's done away from you know the table where it can you know just a- absorb the session and uh, and 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 thus when you have the idea you know you know thirty minutes into the session you have this idea let's do this thing that requires a downtime style system you're you you don't want to lose the narrative impetus of like, let's do the downtimey thing. You want to do it now because you're thinking about it now, but you but the system to do it has been sort of it seems to have been made with the idea that this is going to happen you know, off screen between games or whatever, and therefore you have this this weird disconnect. Uh, I've got okay. another one, another example of one which is probably just a total time bandit divination. Oh, when a player uses something that goes, okay, I roll. All right, GM, you have to give me three hints about something I should do or a vague vision that's allegorical to what's going to come up in this adventure. Uh, wait, go. Some people can come up with the end of spot. Oh, yeah, yeah. some people can. Some people can. And they're like, oh, Oh, there's like, you know, internally, all of the little neurons are panicking and running around. Go, what do we say? What do we say? That's not too obvious, but is still prophetic. Comes off as very sharp, but at the same time, it doesn't give away too much. Man, why are writers so brilliant at this? They start at the end and work backwards. Anyway, it's like, oh, but how how do I do this? And And it's, I had divination powers in one game. And in the end, I said, well, I just retrained these, and the GM said yes, please. And I said, "Grand, fair." Mm. Especially if you've got a, if, if you've got access to it, you know, quite often. It's like, well, do we open this door or not? Hold on a second, I've got the answer for that. It's just going to take me a while. <laughs> um, okay, so that's divination. Oh. Scar, do you have any favorites? 
Well, it's sort of related to the um, uh, the the crafting system idea. Um, one 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 I keep uh, bringing up is uh, the Kevin Crawford uh, faction downtime system, which is designed to be this really useful tool for GM to sort of manage uh, the factions uh, in, in in their game and like what the factions do, what abilities they have, and what where are they what are they doing with those abilities. Uh, so you like you'll set up your faction. Say it has a, a plus six in uh, skullduggery, plus two in wealth, and plus three in you know break people's heads. Uh, and then they'll have like one unit of leg breakers, uh, a unit of spies, and a you know a drug smuggling operation in, in a random city. And these are intended to be both things that factions can use to attack each other, or or make money or whatever. But also something that the G- uh, the players can come stumble across. So if the GMs are in City X and they come into the drug smuggling operation and they uh, knock it over, or whatever, then the, the, the GM can then just go to the the faction sheet uh, and then str- uh, strike off the drug smuggling system. Um, and you know that helps is meant to you know allow both interaction between the players and the factions. But also uh, simplify the process of faction. The problem is that this is also designed to be the same system that uh, players use when they become rich enough to become kings and have their own armies and their own factions doing their own stuff. Mm-hmm. And so the, the system has to have what we would call significant um, hacking like gameplay. And therefore, all of a sudden, this. Thing that this GM tool that is meant to be done used between sessions to uh, make factions go up and down is now dragged into the main game, and now you're starting to have to not only do this interplay of oh, there's this faction here and this faction there, and you have intel in that faction, so you know where their units are, and where their drug smuggling is, but not this faction, and uh, then then there's the additional uh, uh, question of. Um, Okay, but how often do we have a faction turn? Like, we want to have like 10 faction turns right now. Uh, and so the GM has had, I've had three of these in the entire year long campaign because every every day in this campaign takes up 20 sessions because of how detail focused you all are. And, you know. Oh, I like this, the player's problem. But <laughs> you're, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it, it's not necessarily going to be that that like that, but I, I, this is just me extreme example. To sure. Say, but it is bringing a, a a thing that's meant to be like it says in the book. Whenever the GM thinks enough time has passed or enough adventures have, mm-hmm. have, have, have over that the factions should have done something, you know, you could say it's solidly a month if you want, but some people like say it's once per you know player adventure or whatever, and then. Is that enough time for what the the players want? And and you know you're in you're suddenly in this middle ground where the system is kind of useful for players and kind of useful for GMs, but now it has to be in this sort of compromise mode where it works a bit for both, but maybe not ideally. And then you can get cases where a GM might prefer uh, the faction just has like plus three stabbing. I roll for their stabbing. Um, uh, whereas the players would like would like basically like to, well, like two players want to have like this cool board game, and uh, two other players uh, do not want to deal with factions at all. Another player is like, we could do the stabby thing, um, or the money thing, but when it comes to uh, skull dog, we no, 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 we need a new sub. <laughs> I get you. It's a good example because, as you say, it can work fairly seamlessly in the background as long as it's just the GM looking at it and then as soon as you plug players into it it becomes just a whole because if you give players that overview they're going to try and optimize their faction kind of balance and all that kind of crack and that suddenly becomes a game of spreadsheets Um, so that's a good example now question your question so do you have a do you have another good example for us a favorite that we haven't covered yet yeah so I mean like I think Everything we've seen are kind of macro examples, you know, large scale, like 
crafting magic systems, they're fairly well signposted. You know you're going to hit them, you know, because they're big parts of the game or you build a character around it. The ones that I think are also get overlooked are the small things. Like small sections of the game that you, you know, that you don't think at the time, oh yeah, we need to kind of make sure to do that or, you know, have that set up or whatever. But when you go and try and do them and, you know, you, you get completely shocked at how this, in theory, small or, you know, not main part of the game is just going to take over the running of everything. Like I was talking with fellow hosts, uh, Hida, about this, but, you know, one example is Rogue Trader. Now, on the face of it, what I'm going to say sounds like, oh, that's got to be a major part of the game. But you is the traveling system. So namely, you do, you go about, you build your characters, you decide what you're going to, you know, what type of rogue trading you're going to do. You're going to be pirates. You're going to be, you know, people who are just trading stuff on the outskirts. You're going to be, you know, high tech couriers, whatever. You get plans in mind, you got characters, you get load all your stuff, you, you decide what your ship's going to specialize in. Then you get the situation of, okay, we're about to go into the warp, travel to the other part of the, uh, the Imperium. Uh, is there a player a navigator? Nope. Okay, let's look at the chart for this. Uh, you got a, the, the standard navigator on the ship is 30% in the stat. Um, mm. So you just basically need to make a bunch of rolls beforehand to represent all the stuff the players do. And they will just give a bonus to the navigator who's about to make the check. And he fails. And I roll on the <laughs> table and you're all dead. Good game, guys. Good game. <laughs> GG. Amazing. Next time. Like, yeah, it, it's the type of thing where it is a relatively speaking, despite the fact I've talked about, you know, Rogue Trader being about traveling across the galaxy, the actual traveling in theory is a small part of it. But if you roll into that section, it becomes very much a, and now you got to dice with death and, you know, literally could in theory end, end the campaign unless the GM's willing to fudge it, you know? Yeah, you're, you're kind of like, okay, it's not a subsystem you can ignore at all, but somebody has to commit to playing the Navigator now. It's a cool. Um, I disagree on uh, you not being able to ignore it. Uh, if nobody wants to play a navigator, I'm willing to roll it, put in an NPC navigator, or like hand wave it if that's an aspect of the campaign nobody is interested in, um, and just throw in the odd random encounter effectively. Yeah, yep, it's, 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 it's a compromise, but it's not the one listed in the rule book. Like it is. Oh yeah, one, it is one of the absolutely the end. house rules. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't read the rule book then. Um, okay. Yeah, so I mean, it, like, it, it, it absolutely what? just can can go to the the kind of the solution being look the the players all kicked together. Here's a twenty five euro gift, uh, just eat gift card that we're giving to you, GM, on the condition that we never have to roll any navigation for this entire <laughs> campaign. You know, just say that we, we we stunned you with you know all ones every time we need to go anywhere, and we'll all you know have a great time. That's, uh, that's I, I think a way of handling it. <laughs> I, I would. How many how many players can I hold hostage for gift cards oh, to not engage with subsystems? Like, come that, on. Well, there, there's a vein we could exploit, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, th- there's also a, a, an optional alternate so, you know travel system in I believe the Navis Primer book, which uh, frankly is even more dangerous. <laughs> I'm not sure yeah. what the logic behind it was, but uh, it uh, exists. I mean, for for a lot of these kind of systems, I think the the intent is that you know the bad stuff is you know looks really really bad, so it looks cool when uh, you're expertly built. Um, Super veteran navigator avoids it all with the uh, deft rolls, but uh, you know you're, you're, this is still a Wolfruff based uh, uh, rule system. So you know the bad rolls will come up eventually. There's only only so many fate points you can uh, throw at not having demons, uh, uh, you know, hitchhiking uh, around uh, around the back of your uh, your your cruiser. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so if I were to give an example, and you know what, I think I will. Um, the the big macro one is shopping, but I think we all know where that goes. Uh, my favorite subsystem that makes people groan every time it comes up, despite the fact it's not very big, is good old-fashioned D&D, any edition, grappling rules. 
<laughs> like, oh, oh no, this again. It's like uh, the GM grabs the book, like, look up the grappling rules. We never use them. They're always like, wait a second, does that mean this or that? It's a, it's a fun little time sink. If you, if you need a minute, just you know, invoke the uh, the Lord of Grapple. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. And uh, and let it just you know, it's going to take a while. That that combat round going to go on a couple of minutes longer than the usual. It, uh, it's one again, one of those situations where. It, we have to if we want to do it right, quote unquote right. We have to, we have to, uh, you know, put in extra effort in it to make it look all shiny. Um, and yeah. the beautiful thing is, usually, unless you've got a player character optimized for grappling or a monster, it's probably just going to fail. <laughs> it's not going to do anything. But you spend the next couple of minutes doing it, uh, which I think is a perfect example of a subset that just wastes time. Yeah. Um, okay, so. I think we've all uh, we've all taken a good shot on this one, but it has in the course of ruminating. Rules. Eh? We didn't even get into vehicle rules, but uh, we can maybe. Have, well, uh, I mean, if you want, if do we, are we yeah. doing another go round here? Let's start from the top again. Dave, what's your second favorite time waste of a grapple of a uh, a subsystem? Oh god. Um. We, we, these are these are quick fires. Uh, we need uh, the audience cr- to grow to draw their own. Crafting uh, in almost in in, in almost a, a, any system. Excellent, uh, Hida. Two very quick ones in the board game Minion Hunter: The Healing Mechanic. When you got injured, you went into hospital and then spent three turns trying to get out of hospital. I say three turns trying to get out of the hospital. It could be substantially more than that because there's a random encounter table you rolled on. <laughs> And you could very well roll Morlocks. And Morlocks would beat you up and toss you back into the right at the start of the track to try and get out again. It was hell itself. I watched people go into the hospital and spend the entire game in the hospital. The meta of the game became you needed to get the biggest weapon you could and a couple of sacrificial items so you could fight your way out of the hospital. You'd get out the, near the front door, oh, Morlocks jumped you just as you went back in, right back into intensive care. You're going in for surgery, oh, doctor's a Morlock, got to strangle him with a, uh, got to strangle him with some of the cords around the thing, you're going to stab him with your scalpel. That sounds it like was a awesome the worst, scenario. Uh, oh. It is the worst, or it is the worst, because every turn, it's a co-op board game, that's every turn you're not advancing the victory condition. You're just in hospital, getting duffed up by Morlocks and tossed back into hospital. The meta of the game here was like, okay, you need to get the M60 or a flamethrower so you can get out of hospital successfully. <laughs> oh my goodness, let's write a game called Combat Hospital. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> uh, Scar. Oh, as I said, um, uh, vehicle rules in a lot of games just they, they have they, because yeah. car cars are different from people. Uh, it, causes you know again the the gem the designers feel the need to start tossing on subsystem after subsystem uh to make sure that you know driving feels right and then you end this end up with like a chase sequence which are a line of cards across the table and people juking back and forth across um the road and you know if, if you do it right and like I pick on Savage Worlds for this because it's the one I know the best, but it's probably one of the better iterations of it. But yeah, in a lot of systems, um, uh, trying to add in vehicles uh, as anything other than uh, I roll my drive skill check it can just suck up entire sessions. And what's mm-hmm. made this fast, dramatic uh, chase sequence you know, turns into a slog. Of edge cases and uh, you know overly lethal ca- crashing rules. A <laughs> uh, question: you Got a second one you like? Yeah, so ju- just similar to to, o- to Hida's kind of thing there. Just one small system that game that just kind of derails near the end. Uh, Talisman, the old uh, oh, G- GW yeah. kind of board game, where basically you know the entire game is about running around a board, doing all these quests, getting items. Then when somebody gets on the, the track for the crown of command, it just basically becomes this really weird dice rolling section where it's like, yeah, I'm just throwing lightning bolts at you and uh, you got to do all kinds of stuff just to be able to slightly stop me from advancing this win condition. And, you know, it basically splits the game. <clears throat> it makes the second half of the game almost invalidate the first entire section of the game it's sort of like quidditch in in harry potter where it's like yeah and now we've got one rule which makes the previous part of the game completely irrelevant 
uh, well, mm. but it was the journey. It, it, you, you had to do that to get there. It's, yeah. No, I hate talisman things so often. <laughs> so, so I'm happy to stomp on any bit of it. Um, I already mentioned shopping. I think you can all kind of figure out why that's a, a time suck. Uh, oh, actually, but I will. I'll elucidate. Elucidate on the point. Elucidate. Elucidate. Thank you. Uh, I knew I needed to add something extra there. Uh, a C in this case. Um, shopping systems take up time but shopping systems where the designers get cute and introduce kind of rarity or black market modifiers so <laughs> it's just never a simple look up the price like now i gotta now i gotta ask the gm well is it rare in this region uh who owns the you know who owns the supply lines this region the gm's like oh, let me see mm, it's, i don't want to say you can't have it so now i gotta do some math but uh yeah okay so that's the second go round no third go rounds <laughs> that's my rule so, uh, we've all had time to sort of ruminate on, on this question. Can we think of any good ways to overcome the problems of uh, sub game subsystems, e ones that are generally sort of regarded as integral to the fantasy or the system in question? Any good ways to sort of modify or, or fudge these things or speed them up or in some way uh, relieve I some of the friction? Plentiful and very playtesting groups before, you know, to head off to try and head off some of these problems. That's Fair. One. Yeah, don't make it a problem in the first place. Absolutely. <laughs> That's Anyone sort else? of the game design thing. Um, uh, for me, the idea is like, what happens when you see this in the wild? Or it's, it's happening to you. Sure. Um, uh, in which case, you have to sort of foster uh, a willingness in your playgroup to admit, okay, there's a system for this. Let's handle it with emails or over Discord after the session. We've, we've, we've put a pin in it. Like We're going to either try crafting or we're going to try uh, buying the super rare, expensive, um, and uh, government-controlled item. But we're going to do it after the session. Let's keep our narrative momentum and, let, and uh, do the other stuff in-game and not let this particular boondoggle hang over us. Uh, and that 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 requires discipline, which you know can be hard to you know you know the rules contain the fun, etc. Uh, is is this something that you have to to consider? All right. Um, I'm yeah, I'm going back to my uh, oh. my thing of this is an envelope with a, a just eat voucher in it. Um, GM, <laughs> as far as you're concerned, there never was a underwater temple. It was never designed. It was never put in this game. We are all going to keep going with the rest of the campaign, but uh, we are just going to uh, yeah describe what happened without rolling any dice and have it done in five minutes. You dig? Yeah, I uh, I. Uh, I denounce the premise of the question um so yeah it's like no we're just not doing it great uh Hida, on this? if i understand the system you're allowed to use it if i don't understand the system you have to fully <laughs> understand it and explain it to me and be able to explain it to me because that demonstrates a higher level of mastery of it so you have to you'll explain it to me before you're allowed to use it sorry you're gonna have to teach me how it works because if I'm the GM and I've learned all the other subsystems and I've looked at that one and gone, I am not reading this. God, no. Chase mechanics, fie unto you, sir. Fie. It could still take a long time. It could like still it, take it, a long time. But, yeah, but, but if, I'm, not, if, I'm not doing extra homework on top of regular GM homework. If you want to use the Santa Cruz, you've got to read the Santa Cruz. Yeah. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to be optimistic about this and assume that in a group that knew how all this worked, and were willing to engage with it, and uh, the GM was fine with with the you know the, the time taken. Uh, that these things could be managed. Now I still think yes, like and I think hacking and decking are the classic examples. You've got to employ some. You probably have to employ some sort of narrative fiat here to roll what's happening in milliseconds into action that's happening in seconds. Now so. Any t so anytime you're going to engage with the system, it should probably be when it's absolutely critical. So normal hacking, when there isn't time pressure or a fight going on, which is where I'm going with this, that you just that's a hacking roll, straight you know straight roll result difficulty number, um, and we move on. But when combat starts and the decker is like, okay, I'm going to log in, uh, it's like round by round. So the fighters are doing the fighting, the shooters are doing the shooting, and then you get the 
the deck her turn and your system goes this is essentially another type of combat it's a round of combat um but maybe it doesn't have to be a round of combat maybe it can be uh, a hand of blackjack or maybe it can be uh, a round of liar's dice is it uh, yeah liar's liar's poker that's the dice game um with the gm and then back on to the next combat round so keep it fluid keep it quick keep the result tied to the real world i'm not sure that this works quite so well for other examples but i'm, I'm going to go with decking um but yeah i think there's there's definitely you've got to try and decide that it's a critical moment to engage with the subsystem and then make the subsystem work along with other players doing things that matter to them too because that's what we all came here to do roll dice have fun okay that's about and yeah i've just created a huge amount of work so so i know it's not a great uh, answer but it's a good question it's an excellent question and we have to thank the question for posing it thank you the question thank you very much for having me on absolutely it was an absolute pleasure uh, i think we can probably wrap it there some things don't have easy answers but they're uh, they're great fun to mull over um any final thoughts from anyone before we close it out um why did i ask that <laughs> <laughs> We just finished up. We just finished. We're done. Let, me, okay. let me open this box again. I know. I just I'm going to check. It's like OCD. We should keep reopening the, the uh, panel. You must not read from the book. Okay. Oh, so I leave that fast. subsystem closed. The Pete, question you, are you aware how uh, are you aware how these episodes end? Oh, uh, usually you the sign off, right? I loved oh, your. Well, intro. I mean, it, it, it's it's a sort of subsystem for for ending, but I'll I'll give it a give it a Go handle. On. Give um, it a whirl. Look, just treat it like that movie, The Heat. Um, you know, when it comes to games, you know, n- never have a, you know any system that you're not willing, or n- any part of the game that you're not willing to drop at a moment just to get get the game going and you know have some fun. But uh, you know, this has been the adventuring party, and I've got to say that right now, this party is over. Thank you for listening to The Adventuring Party. Join us on our Discord server, where we keep the party going after hours. Uh, Otherwise, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, Twitter, or or you can email the hosts at party at theadventuringparty.net. The Adventuring Party is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike Version 3 license. But you probably knew that already. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and look forward to seeing you back here next week. Goodbye. Boom. Well done. Love it. Okay, that's that. No. Uh, any, anyone got anything on their minds? Um, no, we've we've got enough people here for a good after after credits roll. Um I thought that was going to be the after credit, the you know, you you reopening the the, the entire <laughs> uh, be, yeah. podcast just I'll, after finishing it. I'll uh, I'll I'll go entirely sideways in this because I was supposed to be doing research uh, before we started. Instead, got sucked into a demo for oh wait, I've just reopened it. No, don't do that uh, for a game called uh, what is this? It's on. It's this demo on Steam. Scald against the Black Priory, which I can oh, yeah. highly recommend. Looks great. Uh, I was I'm pushing uh, Chris to play that one as thing because it's totally. Oh, it's entirely his place, bag. Yeah. Kiffer would actually, definitely get something out of it. Actually, uh, Mick, just on on that basis, the um, there is a a mini game in a computer game. Just more on the the topic. Oh, I, yeah. was, I played a while ago. Uh, called Judgment. It's basically a, it's a Yakuza game, you know, the kind of the mm. the the Sega games that were you know pretty much oh, inspired good. by kind of Shenmue, and one of them the. These are games that are infamous for their weird mini games. The strangest one I've come across in Judgment is there is a section for when you pick up keys inside like buildings, which are sort of like dungeons, that there's a mini game for going up to the door and selecting a key from your ring of keys to open the door. Yeah, and you know what? It gets even better. One of the essential talents you can buy with your XP is to always remember which key corresponded to a door oh. after you've unlocked it. Oh, interesting. Okay, so you've got to, you're walking up the door, you've got to figure out which door key to use. And if there's other people around watching you fumble through all the keys, that's is that a problem? 
you know what? I, I don't really penalty? know because I just be, beat people up around and then it's just like, oh, now, now, now it's a little bit of busy work to open this door. But, you know, I spent the XP, so the, the key that I need is actually kind of glowing compared to the other ones. Very good. <laughs> Look, some some games just love their mini games with no context of going. You know, we 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 built a mini game into into this about using selecting keys. We never stopped to wonder: should we have done this? <laughs> what have we done? Dave the Diver is a wonderful game of mini games. If uh, if anyone here has played it, I highly recommend it. Okay, I think that's we're actually done. Done now. Uh, thanks for listening, folks. If you're still here, <laughs> or if this makes it into the edit. But uh, yeah, I gotta go now and. Uh, I gotta go cook something. I'm hungry as all like, oh, get out. Um, and if if I sound particularly gravelly today, it's because I smoked like three or four cigars last night. It's Jesus, doing, God. I know. <laughs> what was the occasion? Uh, I had three or four cigars. <laughs> well, that's as good as any. <laughs> okay, folks. Talk to you later. Bye bye.